Listen to this. First, I'll connect this high Z or high impedance electric guitar to a low impedance input on my interface. It sounds a bit dull compared to the sound we get when I connect the electric guitar to a DI box and then the output of the DI box to a low impedance input on the interface. While you might already know that a DI box can be used to connect high impedance instruments to low impedance microphone inputs, this video will help explain what that actually means. Thanks to Radial for sponsoring this video and supporting audio education. The first thing to know is that we usually want the output impedance of the source to be significantly lower than the input impedance of the destination, 10 to 1 as a general rule. This microphone, for example, has an impedance of 250 ohms written in its specifications. It's currently connected to a device that allows me to adjust the input impedance. So right now, the input impedance of this device is set to 15 kilo ohms, and now it's set to 3 kilo ohms, and now it's set to 150 ohms. So I'll reset that to the highest setting, and the first thing you'll notice is that increasing the input impedance increases the level. So let's match the levels in post-production and try that test again. Right now, the input impedance is set to 15 kilo ohms, and right now it's set to 150 ohms. You can hear that there's a slight change to the tone of my voice, and there's also an increase in noise because more gain is required to achieve the same level. Again, here's 150 ohms, and here's 15 kilo ohms. It seems to sound best when the input impedance of this device is higher than the 250 ohm impedance of this microphone. And for this reason, the mic preamps in my audio interface and in most mic preamps will have an input impedance that is much higher than you'd normally expect in a microphone. In this case, the mic preamp input impedance is 5.4 kilo ohms allowing microphone signals to pass from lower impedance to higher impedance. More on why this is so important in audio in just a moment. First, I want to show you that there's a similar change in sound when we connect a pickup to the wrong type of input on a mixer or an interface. And the effects of this are much more noticeable. That's because the impedance of a high impedance instrument pickup is much higher than what you'd expect from a microphone. For this reason, the input impedance of the instrument input on my interface is one mega ohms. And when I connect this electric base to the instrument input, it sounds great. Meanwhile, connecting that same instrument to the line input on the interface with an input impedance of only 10 kilo ohms will result in a much duller sound. If you've got a mixer or an audio interface with the appropriate input for your source, such as an instrument input for a high impedance instrument, a mic input for a microphone, or a low impedance line input for a low impedance line source, it should sound good. But what do you do when you need to connect a high Z source to a low Z input? Well, a great tool for this is the passive DI box that I used at the beginning of the video. This is the Radial Pro DI, and it has an input impedance of 140 kilo ohms, great for high Z outputs like instrument pickups. And it has an output impedance of 150 ohms, much lower and more suitable for a microphone input. DI boxes like this are very common for connecting high Z instruments to microphone inputs on mixers and audio interfaces. Through the use of a transformer, this passive DI can transfer the signal from the high impedance instrument pickup to the low impedance microphone preamp input. And the sound quality improves dramatically compared to connecting the instrument directly to the low Z input. So if you're connecting a high impedance source to a low impedance microphone input, it's important that you use a DI box. A passive DI not only isolates the circuits and stops DC or direct current from passing, but it also provides a balanced connection, the topic that I'll be discussing in the next video. Before moving on, I want to invite you to download the free cables and connectors guide at audiouniversityonline.com slash cable guide. We're talking a lot about different cable and connector types here, 
And I think that guide would be helpful for you if you're feeling a bit lost. What I want to focus on in this video is the fact that connecting a high Z source to a low Z input has a big impact on sound quality, even over very short distances. And the question I want to answer is why is that the case? Rather than diving straight into math, let's first look at a simple intuitive analogy. I learned this from Dave Ratt, and he admits in his video that it's not a perfect metaphor, but it's definitely helpful. By the way, if you don't know Dave Ratt, go check out his YouTube channel. The example is intended to illustrate the difference between audio signals in high Z circuits versus low Z circuits. When you compare the two, you find that high Z will have a relatively high voltage and relatively low current compared to low Z with relatively low voltage and relatively high current. Dave illustrates this by using a long thin lever to represent high Z and a short thick lever to represent low Z. Now in each case, I'm only moving my hand a little bit and the relatively small movement at the fulcrum of the high impedance lever results in a lot more movement at the other end compared to very little movement with the short lever. But at the same time, the long lever exerts far less force compared to the short lever. Dave likens the movement or displacement on this end of the lever to the voltage, and he likens the force exerted on the other end to the current. The short or low impedance lever doesn't have much displacement or voltage, but it has much more force or current in this analogy. One key feature of a DI box is that it optimizes the higher voltage, lower current signal from the high impedance device on one side of the transformer to a more suitable lower voltage, higher current signal for the low impedance device on the other side. To understand why the sound changes so much when connecting a high Z output to a low Z input, you need to know about Ohm's law. Now, before looking at Ohm's law, let me first admit that I've always found it difficult to intuitively explain how to actually apply Ohm's law. But in researching for this video, I learned a really cool way of explaining it from the Alder Audio YouTube channel. It helped me a lot, and I think it's gonna help you too. Ohm's law states that voltage equals current times resistance, or voltage equals I times R. In audio, we're dealing with alternating current though, so let's change that to voltage equals I times Z, or voltage equals current times impedance. The most important thing to understand right away is that impedance is similar to resistance, but it's frequency dependent, which is really important in audio where we're dealing with signals that contain many different frequencies at the same time. While the specs I've shown you in this video state only one number, for the input impedance or output impedance of the devices, that is actually just the impedance at a particular frequency, say one kilohertz. In reality, the impedance of any circuit will vary throughout the frequency spectrum. That means the impedance at 100 hertz is likely not the same as the impedance at one kilohertz, which is likely not the same as the impedance at 10 kilohertz, and so on. And this is critical because it explains why we don't just hear an overall level difference, but also a tonal difference when connecting high Z to low Z, because frequencies throughout the spectrum are not being impacted in the same way. For this discussion about impedance, let's rearrange Ohm's law so that impedance equals V over I. This represents the same relationship, just written differently. And when it's written this way, it becomes more apparent that impedance is simply the ratio of voltage to current. Again, this example comes straight from the Alder Audio YouTube channel, and I recommend you go check out that video. Say we have a 1000 Hertz sine wave on the high Z circuit. The amplitude of the voltage in red is 10 volts, and the amplitude of the current in blue is five amps. Now these numbers are completely arbitrary. They're just simple values that we can use to plug in. Referencing Ohm's law, we can look at the ratio of five amps to 10 volts and we know that the impedance of this circuit at 1000 Hertz is two ohms. Meanwhile, a sine wave at a much lower frequency of 100 Hertz might have a voltage of 10 and a current of only one. In other words, at 100 Hertz, the impedance is 10 ohms. 
because the ratio of volts to amps is 10 to 1. So although these two sine waves have the same voltage amplitude on this circuit, as you'll see in a moment, they'll be impacted very differently when we connect this circuit to the lower impedance input on our mic preamp. The input of the preamp will have an input impedance. Let's say it's 5 ohms. And there will be an amplification circuit that reads the voltage of the signal. Not the current, the voltage. In this case, because the input impedance is 5 ohms, we know that the ratio between voltage and current must be 5. So something has to come down, either voltage or the current, so that there is a 5 to 1 ratio of voltage to current. Nothing will be increased here. Something needs to be reduced. And this is where we start to see the voltage affected differently at some frequencies compared to others. In the case of 1000 Hertz, the current is reduced to 2 amps, bringing the ratio of voltage and current to 5. Notice that the voltage stays the same, which is what our mic preamp responds to. However, in the case of 100 Hertz, the voltage will need to be reduced to 5 volts in order to bring the ratio to 5 to 1. Now the voltage has changed, giving the 100 Hertz sine wave a lower amplitude of voltage than the 1000 Hertz sine wave. The mic preamp responds to this relative voltage difference, and that results in a relative level difference between these two frequencies, which were equal in the original circuit. This is where we get to the guideline to structure your signal chain so that the input impedance of the receiving device is at least 10 times greater than the output impedance of the sending device. If you follow this guideline, ideally the voltage of the signal will never need to be reduced, only the current. I expect the real electrical engineers out there will say that this isn't a perfect explanation. And you're probably right, but for me, in the context of audio production, these explanations have been very helpful and I hope they help you as well. But in addition to all of this, there's still another reason to use a DI box, and that is to harness the noise rejecting power of balanced audio connections. It's one of the coolest concepts in audio, and it's what I'm demonstrating for you in the next video. So click the link, and I'll see you there.